but I'm not sure. But I like to cook. <laughs> and I'm a good cook. <laughs> but I also like to entertain. And so, from time to time, I like to call my friends or my family over for dinner. And for me, entertaining doesn't just, ha just happen. For me, there's a process. I go through what is it that I'm going to cook with the people who are coming, what can I make for them that will be special for them, and then I say, what kind of table do I want to set? Do I want white tablecloths? Do I want black tablecloths? Do I want brown ones? How many plates am I going to set? Is this a five-course meal or a three-course meal? I go through the whole nine yards trying to figure out what exactly I'm going to do for this dinner party. And so I have to make sure the table's set right, have the right type of flowers or whatever the centerpiece is going to be. Is it the right type of drink? Is it like juice or is it wine or is it something else? And I go through all the motions of setting the table and making sure it's stuck just right. And some of my friends, sometimes they'll come a little early and so they'll realize that I need help and they start asking me for help and I say, set the table for me. And when they don't do it right, I come back around and they say, you know what? I'm just gonna sit in the living room and I'm gonna let you do your thing. Because I grew up in a family where entertaining or when people came to your house, there was always food. Whether you came to our house or whether you went to my aunt or my, even my godmother's house, even if you were just dropping by unannounced, there was always food to be had. There's something about the intimacy of having a meal around the table with, some, with a group of people, right? Many conversations are had around the table, right? So, some good old time storytelling of remember wins, right? Or uh, some real heartfelt, emotional things, stories that are told about what's going on in each other's lives. And maybe it is that you gather around and not only do you have good food, but you have good drink and good company. And what more can you ask for? In today's gospel lesson, Jesus is invited for a meal around the table. And he's invited by a Pharisee, and the Pharisee has some of his friends all gathered around this table, this intimate place. And in the midst of this intimacy, in walks this woman who comes in and who becomes a part of this, this dinner table unannounced. Have you ever had unannounced guests at your dinner table? You know, those of, those of you who are who cook, you know you cook more, right? I always say I'm leaving room at the table for Elijah. You never know who's going to come in. And so this woman walks in, but she's no ordinary guest. She's no ordinary person. First of all, she's a she. Problem number one. Second of all, she's a sinner. Problem number two. Third of all, none of these men are her husband. Problem number three. Because during the time of Jesus, women knew their place. And it wasn't among the men. It was doing the work of the house. And doing the work of the hosting. And making sure that all the people gathered in their presence or in their house were taken care of. But it wasn't among the men. And so this woman boldly comes in to uninvited into someone's house. Now, let me ask you a question. If someone you didn't know boldly walks through your front door and sits at your dinner table, what are you going to do? Some of you said they were going to serve, but let's be real. We're going to follow the police, right? <laughs> let's be serious. Right? You come into my house unannounced, I'm calling the cops because I don't know you. Now it's different if it was a barbecue, and so, you know, in a barbecue, many people come in that you don't know. But this is at a dinner party where you know how many guests are supposed to be around that table. And what is so interesting is the Pharisee, first of all, the Pharisee and Jesus having dinner. That's number one. Because we know that throughout the gospel, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are trying to trap Jesus, trying to figure out what can we do to make sure that we bring him to the officials. 
And so the Pharisees are, are gathering constantly to trap him. But this Pharisee says, I'm not going to go by what other people say. I'm going to invite the man into my house to see for myself what's going on. He's not taking the word or the opinion of anybody else. And so he sits around the table with probably some other Pharisees and Sadducees who want to have the opportunity to question this man they call Jesus. And so when the woman walks in, the man is stunned. The man is looking and thinking to himself, what is going on here? If Jesus was truly Jesus, he wouldn't be talking to this, this woman. If he were a great prophet, he would know that this woman is a sinner. As if the man himself wasn't a sinner also. Amen. But he, the, the Pharisee came out, kept thinking about this all in his head. Let me ask you a question. When a stranger walks in your midst, do you greet them or do you judge them? Did, she, he really wouldn't be talking to her. But Jesus, being Jesus, hears him and responds. And Jesus responds in such a way that it makes the Pharisee be quiet. Because after his response, he speaks no more. But before we get to Jesus' response, there's this woman who heard that Jesus was in town, who has been going through some things. You guys go through your own thing, so you know what that woman probably was going through. She was going through some things. And she didn't care what was going on. She didn't care about any social norms. She didn't care if she wasn't supposed to talk to men, touch men, be around men. She didn't care. All she knew was that she had a problem, and Jesus was going to be the one to solve it. And so she comes in boldly through those doors goes to Jesus and starts crying. She never muttered one word. All she did was start crying, the tears flowing so strongly that it is enough to wash Jesus' feet, enough to, to, to cleanse his feet, and that, then if else fails, she didn't have a towel, so she had her hair, she let her hair down, and she dried them with her hair. Now, us women know that our hair is precious, right? Right, most of us are not gonna do that. But in Jesus' time, not only did she break the protocol of talking to a man that wasn't her husband, but she showed her hair to a man that wasn't her husband. But this woman didn't care. She had a problem, and who was gonna fix it? Jesus. And so she goes and she kneels at his feet. And I'm probably sure that this ointment that she's rubbing on his feet was expensive. And that she probably couldn't afford it. But nothing was too great for the opportunity to kneel at the Savior's feet. And so she cleans his feet, she dries his feet, and she anoints his feet with oil in preparation as to what was to come. And no one knew it at the table. Now. Can anybody tell me what my sermon series is entitled? Ordinary things. Extraordinary things. Okay. <laughs> ordinary times, extraordinary moments. This is an ordinary dinner. There's nothing unusual about gathering friends around a dinner table to have a meal, because we've all done it. But it is a little bit unusual to have Jesus sitting there. It is kind of unusual to have this woman crying so profusely at the feet of Jesus, making all the others uncomfortable trying to figure out what's going on. This is an extraordinary moment. And Jesus has this opportunity to teach and to heal. He starts by teaching the Pharisees, the Pharisee who is questioning inside of his heart why Jesus is talking to this sinner, he has an opportunity to teach him by telling him a story. Because Jesus never really comes direct at you. 
very rare that he comes straight. And so he tells the story of a, a, a person who probably is the loan, the bank, the mortgage, the whatever you can think of in your life that you owe money to. He tells the story of this company or this man who owe, who's, who's owed money by people who have borrowed and those people cannot pay. Now, how many of you have been in the cannot pay position? Because <laughs> I, I know I've been there a couple of times, right? And, and Jesus says that this man felt some compassion in his heart to forgive the debt. How many of us wish that the mortgage company would forgive our debts? <laughs> or the car loan place or whatever bill you have that would just forgive the debts. How would you feel? For those of you who have luckily paid off your mortgage, you remember how that felt, right? So Jesus questions the guy, but teaches this Pharisee in the moment that the only way to respond to people in need is to have compassion. Because you have the capacity within you to have this compassion for the stranger or for someone in need. This woman didn't come into your house begging for food. This woman came into your house begging for that thing that only Jesus could do, that healing that could only happen internally inside of her, and the only person to do it was going to be Jesus. And he wasn't going to turn her away. And so she, he teaches in that moment that it's better to have compassion for this notorious sinner who has so many sins that Jesus even named. She has so many sins you don't even know the half. Many of us, when we look at someone, we judge them right away. Whether we greet them with kindness or a warm welcome of hello, we've already sized them from head to toe. We've already put them in a category, or we're probably wondering when they speak which category we will put them in. But make no mistake, we are all judges in this room. And if you don't believe me, I'm going to hand something out to you. Okay. Now, what do you see? You see a picture. A woman, a female. How many of you will see female? Pretty much everybody. What else do you see? Okay, so Two faces. What are those two faces? Okay, those of you who see one face, is the face old or young? Okay. Okay, so people see young a young face. Anybody see another type of face? Old face. So how many people see old face? How many people see young face? All right. Now this is the same picture you're all looking at. There's no one that you can look at your neighbor. You didn't get anything different, right? There's no correct answer to this question. It is definitely a woman. And depending on your perspective of what you're looking at, or how you view things, you either see young or you see old. You guys are looking at the same picture but have come to different conclusions. But also, what yes. I've seen also is a picture of a boy. Where is that? Okay. <laughs> a boy? Yes. All right. And you're the first person that I've ever heard say that. We're going to hold on to that. <laughs> The point of looking at this picture is to talk about our perspective. That we all see the same thing but come up with different opinions of that one thing. We all have judgments of characters within us. We see young from one perspective and old from another. And I don't think it has to do with age. I still haven't found the old woman in it, but I definitely see the young woman. And I don't know if it's because I'm on the younger side and I have to wait till I get down to the other side, but I know that there are a lot of people in here who saw a young, a young girl. 
the, the Pharisee, when, she, when he looked at this woman, all he saw was a sinner. When Jesus looked at her, he saw someone in need of helping. Someone who was crying out from the inside and not just about what he saw on the outside. He calls us to go beyond looking at the surface and go deep inside a person to see their pain and to understand that you are a sinner just as they are a sinner, right? Because none of us are sinless, right? We all have done some things, right? And sometimes we continue to do some things. Right? And so Jesus is calling the Pharisees out, before you get to judging this person, take a second look and see the lines on her face, see the lines on the tears from her eyes, and a new and different perspective. Because it is better to have compassion than to have a hardness of heart that doesn't do anything or doesn't change the way this woman is according to your thought process. Because if you are just judging her as a prostitute, then that's all she'll ever be. But if you open up your heart and your home and, and your everything to her and give her compassion, perhaps she might think twice about her career and what she does. Perhaps she will see the face of Jesus in you and change her ways. I always say that we are, are Christ to people and people are Christ to us. The person you encounter, whether you like them or not, whether you think that they are worthy or not, you are encountering God in that moment. Remember, Jesus said to us that when I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was in need of clothing, you clothed me. And the question was, when did we do that? Whenever you did it to the least of these. And Jesus in this moment is teaching the Pharisees, you got to do this. You got to show her compassion. You can't live in the realm of judgment, but in the realm of compassion. So that's one character. And now this woman, this sinner, we've already established that we are all sinners, right? Yes. And if you're sinless, please raise your hand. <laughs> Right? Because none of us is zero months old. Because I think I get past past six months, maybe a year after. After a year, you know, we start doing things. So this woman comes to Jesus because she knows that that's the only place to do, to come. And so she teaches us a lesson. We know that within our sins and within our pain, within our hurt, that the only place we really can find solace is in God's hands. It's the only place to come is to come to the house of the Lord, to kneel down and worship and to just praise him and ask him for whatever it is that we need. But as I've often said, before we get to God, we go to Tom, Mary, Jane, and all the other people in between. And we, st we still feel the same pain and the same problems and we keep wondering, why is nothing changing? But have you cried those tears to God? Have you brought yourself down to God's foot and just said, Lord, help? This woman was in so much pain, no words were uttered out of her mouth. Sometimes we're going through it and no words can come or no word or expression can really truly say what the pain is in our hearts, but the tears that come down our eyes or our fact that we get on our knees and just start shaking our heads. Sometimes I felt some pain that I just, all I do is just shake and I just rock back and forth and say in my head, Lord, it's gonna be okay. But the woman is teaching us the place to go to get the healing that we require and we need, it's not out there, but it's with God. It's the ability to know, to have the faith that no matter Hot people are saying, no matter how many times you come through this door and you feel that you're going to be judged by people, you come anyway because you need your blessing. Amen. All right? It doesn't matter what they say. You need what belongs to you, and that is God's healing grace. And so you come through the doors, you kneel at the altar, you kneel wherever it is you kneel, 
or you speak to whoever it is you need to speak to in order for God to give you that blessing. You have to have the faith to believe it in your heart that whatever you bring to him, he will handle. Because Jesus says to her, it's because of her faith that she is saved. Because of our belief, we are saved. And I think that, I know that I said earlier in the um, two weeks ago that it's not just about our faith. Faith is important. But the reality is God saves and heals us way before we pay attention to it. And so we have to be willing to turn our eyes to recognizing it in our lives. Or we have to be willing to wait patiently. And waiting can be eternity sometimes. Some of us are still praying for things that we prayed for five years ago. Wondering, when is it going to be our turn to win that lottery? right? <laughs> but we have to be patient and to wait. Yesterday, I went to um, Massachusetts to go to Six Flags. I just wanted to have a little break. And so I was standing in line for a roller coaster, and it was a long line. If you've ever been to these amusement parks, these lines are long. And sometimes I wonder, what else could I have been doing with my time than standing in this line? But I was standing in line and I was getting frustrated because I kept watching people pass me by, pass me by. And I'm like, what's going on? And finally the person behind me said, oh, those are the people that paid an extra hundred dollars so it's not to wait. <laughs> we live in a world where we can't even wait online just to, to stand on a ride. That we would gladly pay a hundred dollars extra to jump all the people in front of us to feel important so that we can instantaneously feel that thrill. But let me ask you, you guys know your struggles, right? Do you think you would be the person you are today if you had not struggled? That you just jumped to that success? Do you think you would have appreciated it as you appreciate it now? We have to learn to be patient. We have to reintroduce waiting and patiently waiting back into our society. This instantaneous success or this need to be instantaneously successful without going through the internship in the mailroom and working your way up. And when you get to the top or you start at the top, you don't even know what you're doing at the top. Because you don't know what the people are doing at the bottom. You don't know. So we are called to wait on God, God's timing, and to have faith in knowing that he will do what he said he will do. If you ask it, it shall be done. If you knock, the door will be open. But it will be open on God's time and no other time. And that's really hard to do. But God calls us to talk about your trouble and stuff. Come lay your burdens right here on the altar and allow him to heal you. And so finally we see that Jesus, in this story, he shows us compassion, and he shows us what forgiveness is. And forgiveness is a very hard thing to do. You take a deep breath, you hear and you read that Jesus says forgive, and God says forgive, and, and you just wonder, I don't know if I can do it. There's too many people who have broken me too many times. My heart is shattered or hardened or whatever. I don't know if forgiveness can come easily. I was called to jury duty one time. And you know, you, when you go through the jury selection, you know, they try to ask you all kinds of questions. And I was it made sure, because I didn't want to do jury duty, so I made sure to wear my collar that day. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I rarely do these rare moments that I wear my collar, but that day I made sure to have it on and the biggest one I could find. <laughs> and I was sitting there and they finally called me up and I was like, okay. And so I sat and, and the, the lawyer for the defendant, oh no, was it the lawyer for the defendant or the prosecutor? I can't remember whether it was the prosecutor or the lawyer for the defendant said, chose me to start having this conversation. Oh, so you're a priest, huh? I said, yes, I do work as, as a priest. So you believe in God? I said, yes, I believe in God. He said, so, so your will is just forgive and forget, right? I said, I, before I could even answer, he moved on to somebody else. Because <laughs> I had an answer for him at that point. I was like, wait a minute, now all of a sudden, now I want to be on this jury. Because God doesn't call and say forgive and forget. We don't have at 
amnesia, right? We're going to remember that this person hurt us, right? But he does call us to forgive even in the depths of our pain. Even in the depths of our pain. This woman is crying out and she's forgiven. I'm pretty sure she has people that she needs to forgive as well. And she's hurt God in so many different ways by being with men that aren't her husband. As if these men weren't with women that wasn't her, their wives. It goes both directions, by the way. But God knew that we caused pain to him so much so that Jesus Christ came down to start teaching, to start preaching the good news that forgiveness is being offered to you. And that same forgiveness that is being offered to you out of the depths of God's own love for you, you are required to do the same for those around you who have broken your heart, who have caused you pain. That if Jesus can come down on the earth, God's son can come down because God loves us so much that he let his son come down, die on the cross for us. Who are we not to do the same for our brothers and sisters who've hurt us? Even though it's difficult. Even though we know we can't forget. Perhaps that the forgiveness doesn't start with the people out there, but it starts with you in here inside. Perhaps you need to look into your own heart and see where you have broken yourself. Sometimes we like to blame the world out there and never really take a look at what we've done to ourselves. And so we are called to forgive ourselves and to forgive others in our hearts. This ordinary dinner demonstrates an extraordinary moment teaching to us what it means to forgive, to love, to offer compassion, and to find peace within. Jesus tells her, your faith has set you free. Go in peace. That peace is offered to each of us this day. Amen. Amen.